Hello and a warm welcome to the CNBC Africa special debate. I'm Nozi Pumbandra. And joining me as my co-host, I have Chris Bishop, editor of Forbes Africa. Chris, welcome. Good to have you at the Thank desk. Thank you very much. I think infrastructure is one of the great stories of Africa. And I'm looking forward to this debate because in the richest province in the continent here. It's interesting to see how it's going to play out. Let's see what your sharp mind can deliver today. Now, the public, public sector infrastructure is the cornerstone of economic development, social upliftment, public health and safety. Infrastructure assets and community facilities are complex by nature and require robust management practices, especially in a bustling province like Gauteng. Over the next hour, we'll be taking a closer look at Gauteng's government property assets, including the strategies behind ensuring that they are managed efficiently in order to meet the needs that they were built for. Joining us in studio to unpack these issues, we have Badani Mashlangu, MEC, Gauteng Department of Infrastructure Development, Eric Noir, Director of WSP Green by Design, and William Harris, CEO of G Maven. Everyone, welcome uh, to the desk and thank you so much for making the time. MEC, perhaps let me first come to you. When we uh, hear of the economic growth story on the continent, oftentimes uh, it's said that infrastructure is going to sustain that growth. In light of that, is the province on track? I think so, uh, because uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of work that we are doing. Of course, we're working with the state-owned enterprises in the province, as well as municipalities. Uh, for instance, uh, I know for a fact that ESCOM will be spending about 7.8 billion rand on uh, their distribution network, as well as um, energy transmission uh, infrastructure. Municipalities are doing the same, and this is to enable a, a business people and households in Gauteng to be able to have a, a security of energy and, and of course if you are an economic hub like we are we've got to be guaranteed that indeed your business is not, not going to shut down because uh, you don't have sufficient electricity of course in terms of water uh, we know that the the growth in the province has really led into number of projects um, being stalled by municipalities not being approved because we do not have sufficient uh, stormwater drainages that to allow at expansion of the province and again it was because of the um, unplanned and uncoordinated um, uh, approval of plans mm. which uh, allowed houses to be developed where the stormwater drainages and, and on all of those when was not sufficient. Of course the other important element is around the sustainability of our water infrastructure. Yeah. It's just make sure ensuring that the future generation have access to those uh, into the future. Of course uh, you know that the province has invested that working with Sandral a um, huge amount of money on the housing improvement um, uh, 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 We've got one of some of the best roads in the province and the plan is really is to make sure that into the future there's work done uh, we've got the decent um, investment by Prasa that is looking into upgrading train stations uh, in the townships coming into town um, and then all of that the park station is a different station than it was 10 years ago so all of this work that is going para state house provincial government we're spending a lot of work um, a lot of money into building new schools um, and some of them are totally green schools so and I'm confident that uh, the work that we, we have done over the past uh, uh, five years and mm. we continue to do with a parastatal in the medium term expenditure framework is going to pro put the province in a different light. Of course, for instance, if you look around Newtown, uh, you see cranes. Um, uh, there's companies that the land that has been disposed by the city of Johannesburg is mm. allowed um, private companies or to come on board. You know that uh, I think um, Transnet has just announced that uh, that standing uh, railway, uh, whatever carriage that is there, there's going to be investment going on there. So we're really excited that Gauteng is really taking a shape uh, into the future and infrastructure is at the lead of it. Now in all of this, MEC, one of the tasks you've completed this year mm -hmm. is to find out exactly what the province owns in mm. terms of property. Um, I understand that you didn't actually know what you owned and, and who was in there. This must have been a hell of a task. The truth is we still don't know half of the things we own. Um, I get surprised every time people say, well, you've got houses in Kelvin, you've got a house in Kelvin, it's illegally occupied. I like to rectify my status. And when we go there, we find out it's not one house. It's more than one house mm. that we own. We own house in Bryanstein and people now, at least because they know that we're trying to get the asset register sorted out. They're coming out and indicating to us those kind of things. So the bottom line of 
wanting to get to know what the state owns is going to help us to understand what we can do with those buildings, whether we dispose with them or we simply list them out or we simply demolish and, and, and de redetermine the use of that land. So the, the asset register, we've appointed Ernest and Young with a consortium that includes Big in Africa and Adnet uh, to, to do this work for us. Um, the first milestone is March next year and, and by the end of December um, next year we'll be getting a sense of exactly what we own but I'm very confident that the work that we're doing is going to enable the South Africans to know what provincial government own or what we don't own. Uh, I mean William Harris uh, <laughs> of G Maven you, you're in the property game um, how big is this task and, but how vital is it at the same time but how difficult is it going to be? Hmm. Yeah, the, the big thing uh, is, is a process that uh, I think uh, we're busy unpacking, uh, and, and this is obviously when I say we, I'm talking to the, the MEC. Mm -hmm. um, vital, it's, I think, uh, of paramount importance. Uh, you, you've got to have a clear understanding of the assets that you control. Mm -hmm. uh, once you, that's the first step, from that you can then start unpacking uh, the revenues that you can extract from these assets um, and, and devising a strategy to, to sweat and, and and, and use them properly. Um, I mean, let me see, this. it must be very costly as well, an exercise like this. It is costly, but it's uh, those costs, once you've completed the asset, you're going to, I mean, we projected to spend not more than 300 million just to try and complete this task. But once the property, as the asset register is complete, um, it is estimated it will be worth about uh, more than 20 billion rand. So they in what the money we're putting in now, it's really going to be compensated by the value of the asset register when it's fully complete. So I think there'll be more value derived by government once we have a proper asset register than the case is now. People are occupying buildings illegally, they're not paying rates and taxes. Some of the uh, buildings are in the land owned by municipality. Uh, there's just uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 commotion. Uh, just one short question I have to ask MVC is that how did it arrive in this uh, position in the first place over the last 20 years? Uh, remember, one difference uh, with Gauteng is that we did not have the Bantu Stands government. Mm -hmm. um, so the properties largely were under the, the TPA and also under the national government and later on they were devolved the, into the provincial government and all of that. So in trying to clean up that process, uh, of course it take, it's taken us a long time to get to where we are now, but now we've decided that we want to ensure that the property asset register of government, we must set a, have certainty about it and that's why we're involved in this exercise that we're involved in, of course taking things from, like some of the uh, properties are still revested under RSA yet that in the provincial mm -hmm. government the uh, register some of them are still vested the uh, under tpa and all of those things so that's what we're trying to correct and and i'm confident that in the next coming uh, 18 months we'll have a solid um, a product that will benefit all south africans in terms of knowledge and understanding what we own and what we don't right moving mm -hmm. perhaps uh, from uh, the uh, the property asset management and perhaps looking at the fraudulent activity that often follows lease agreements uh, not only in this province but uh, country Countrywide. What is the department doing differently to ensure that we are able to root out any corruption that happens around the space and have uh, fraud-free lease agreements? I think one of the important things uh, which has been our weakness uh, over a period of time, and I'm just talking generally in government, that our contract management um, has not been really uh, up to scratch, where, for instance, we've allowed people who knows nothing about property to come into the property space. Um, for instance, I know there's a lot of black players, a uh, few black players, who knows uh, the, the politics and the, pro the economics in the property space, yet you have those who've owned properties before who like to rent those, uh, like kind of a rent mm. a, a black person, uh, I've got, I'm, I'm empowered in BE, therefore, therefore, therefore. And they simply take advantage of them because they know nothing about these things. They give them overpriced um, uh, uh, buildings, and of course the state has to pay those overpriced buildings. I think we've, uh, where we are, I mean in the province, we do not have any of those cases um, as far as I know if there is, um, there are very, very uh, uh, less of those because we've, pay, we've paid attention as to who do we enter into lease agreement with. There is a policy uh, that was approved by National Public Works a while ago which simply says if a building is owned by a, 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 a BEE, wholly black company, you give them nine and, and, and whatever, you can give them more than nine years a lease. If a building is owned by 
51% black, you can give them a three year lease. If a building is uh, owned by black people, 25%, you can give them a three year lease. So we're following those principles in order to drive transformation. Probably we're aware that uh, the property industry is one of those uh, industries that is not transformed. Yeah. Um, out of the probably 150 billion rands uh, turnover of the industry, uh, black people, of course, I think they've only benefited about 10 billion rands or so. And, and there's a, it, through this policy, we can drive transformation by ensuring that the proper black people who've taken interest into the uh, property space, they understand and we can be able to enter into better leases and that will benefit the state as well as uh, them to, to, to enter into the business and understand it better. Perhaps to bring uh, Eric into this mm. conversation, mm. Uh, I, I'd like to pose a question to you first, MSA, and I want us to turn our focus to your urban and inner city renewal uh, mm. targets and how uh, making sure that these are environmentally compliant in terms of uh, making sure that they are green buildings, whether it's new buildings or, or refurbishments, is a part of that target. Um, the last discussion we held here, we spoke about a lot of green things. The Gauteng Global City Region uh, has introduced green um, infrastructure, which simply says, uh, not necessarily about buildings per se, but the environment around the buildings, how to plant as many trees as, and put a lot of grasses and plants and all of those. But over and above that, we are aspiring to have most of our buildings in the next coming three years to have a, a five-star um, green building ratings. And there's work that we're doing with the SAPS and many other government agencies who are supported by a uh, national government in this regard. Uh, the intention really is to have all our building to have um, a, a proper water demand management um, as well as partnering with ESCOM around retrofitting all our buildings. Uh, also, we are in the process of retrofitting the schools uh, in terms of uh, solar um, solar roof and, and retrofitting hospitals in terms of getting um, a gas into those. So the plan really is to really go full st full steam in ensuring um, that we do this work. And we're also talking to international uh, companies around the uh, learning of how building like a state empire building in the U.S., uh, as old as it is, it, they've may been able to make it green, make it green. Uh, buildings in the UK also owned by the state, they've been able to make them green. And we're partnering with a number of stakeholders, including locally, to make sure that all our state buildings are fully compliant and are totally green. So Eric, clearly the political will is there to make sure Absolutely, that buildings yeah. are green. I mean, well, how much commitment is there from business to um, carry the costs? Maybe. I think it's, it's quite an interesting turning point. I think we're at the cusp of something radically different now, where it's been largely voluntary over the last 10 years. Uh, now it's, it's becoming the norm. And you find that property developers are not really anymore considering buildings that wouldn't embark on green mm -hmm. because there is clear financial benefits of, of going green. Whether it's certified or not, that's a slightly different story but um, people are very aware of that in a in a private sector at the same time the public sector is coming up with a national draft legislation mm -hmm. to require that all buildings are certified uh, that's uh, in common period at the moment and it's it's coming into into place very shortly so we find that both the private sector and the public sector are really embarking on on greening the built stock what I would like to say, in a sense, is that a city which is made of a collection of green buildings is not going to make a green city. Right. There's a huge amount of work that needs to be done at the infrastructure level um, in terms of efficiency for water, leakages, and those kind of things, in terms of alternate source of energy, better energy mix. Our energy is carbon intensive, and that's a national issue, rather. Um, but also, I think that what we're doing to ourselves in terms of public mobility it's just terrible. I was in the in the city of Douala in Cameroon, and the captain of the harbour was telling us that 30% of their operating cost is dredging. And I like that story because that's in a sense what we're doing to ourselves in an African city. We're peddling inefficiency, mm -hmm. trying to get to and from. Mm -hmm. uh, we we have possibly particularly in South Africa, the legacy of the apartheid planning, which has uh, a, a, a single zoning of the different suburbs. So we have a city for living, a city for working. The one is mm -hmm. empty at night, the other one is empty during the day. And we spend mm -hmm. our time between the two. Mm -hmm. um, so I think at the, at the public mobility, there's a huge amount of, um, of gains that we can make. And I think that Harteng in particular with the Hart train, with the Prazas, and we, we into into serious progresses in here. But still, I think we can do much better. 
uh, and that will dwarf from an energy point of view any efficiencies we might achieve in, at a single building level. I mean, one question playing devil's advocate here, how many times have we heard as householders, if you put in solar, power, heating, it'll, it'll pay for itself within three years, but you probably find most people still don't do it. Do you think it's time for the legislators and for the lawmakers to get tougher and say, no, okay, there's no, no deal, you've got to have green energy in your house? Or else? Well, legislation is coming in that way. Mm. The new Sandstone 400, for instance, requires that 50% of all domestic hot water comes from non-resistive source, so no, no geyser, for instance, and that's legislation for any new building, only 50% of it, and that's driven around the, the, the heat pumps, which have a coefficient of performance of two, so one unit of energy, two electrical energy, two units of heat, for instance, coming up. Uh, but that, that's coming into place. Yeah, but if you uh, maybe take a couple of steps back, maybe a week back, and we look at uh, the, the closure of uh, COP19, and uh, how the, some of the comments that have come out have said perhaps this uh, round has been somewhat of a regression in terms of the commitments that were made not being as firm as previous rounds. Are you still confident then, in light of that, that we are moving in the right direction? Yeah, uh, the, the, the series of COP is quite an interesting one. I'm not terribly fascinated with, with the actual negotiations and what happened. Mm. I'm more fascinated with the process. Mm. I think it's extraordinary that we can gather 190 plus nations around one table to discuss. What comes out of it is a difficult one. You'll find that we're asking our negotiators, and our negotiators, our South African negotiators, Alf Wills in particular, are doing an extraordinary work, and, and their, their assistants and, and department. Um, but we're asking them to negotiate the impossible. The developed country have uh, an economic crisis in their hand. The developing countries mm -hmm. have a social crisis. Mm -hmm. We probably share in common uh, an environmental crisis. Right. And to me, if, if we don't do as societies, whether it's private or public, if we don't do the right things, we will keep on sending our, ne our negotiators negotiating the impossible. Mm. If we're doing the right things, I can guarantee you our negotiators will have a yearly tea party and have fun, <laughs> and it's going to be easy. Right. Go ahead. Just moving ahead. Further on here, there's a lot of talk about inner city renewal of Johannesburg um, in recent years. Just Tell us, um, I mean, there is a school of thought, particularly in Forbes magazine, and the fact that um, government should just clear the way for private money to uh, regenerate. What's your feeling as MEC? I, I don't think that there's a replacement for partnership in any, in any situation, whether you look at the, how we deliver health care or how we deliver um, um, the government uh, services, like in the space where we are operating. It's important to have partnerships. Uh, for instance, one of the things we're looking into is to get a um, partnership between property owners in the city center, the job at property company and DAD, then to say, okay, we own buildings, all of us. What is that we can do together? Job at property company are part of the, and the job at housing company, they're looking to provide people houses. For instance, the point he was making that we've got two um, scenarios, people, the empty cities at, at night mm -hmm. and, and the empty townships during the day, whatever. So at night people leave, uh, 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 they leave uh, work and they go back home and vice versa. So if we were to create a scenario that we use these buildings, like it is a norm um, in other parts of the world, and I think there is a, a work that uh, started in the city by private companies. You create uh, probably from whatever seven floors up upwards, you create offices and the rest of the other part, you create residential areas, the rest of the other uh, uh, spaces used for offices. Mm -hmm. You will create um, a conducive uh, uh, and, and a situation where people can live in town and be able to, to, to work in the same space where they are working and you reduce transport costs. Uh, there is a study that was done by different um, uh, um, organizations amongst, and I think Status A also uh, made this point in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the work that they do from time to time that many poor South Africans spend more than 40 percent of their earnings mm. in transport costs right so if we're to deal with that one of the things that we've got to look into is exactly creating um, living spaces that are conducive for people to to be able to afford and do that but if you look in Newtown and the downtown towards uh, not far from the APSA um, a complex there are buildings uh, properties that were started by government for to, through the RTP and um, the interventions those properties are simply meant to 
say, yes, even no matter how, uh, whatever level of salary you are, mm -hmm. we can pre create a conducive environment for you to live in town, which is uh, you can afford. And I think we need to look into those things. There are buildings that have been hijacked. How do we take those buildings and create that kind of a living space for people to work there? So there is indeed mm -hmm. an opportunity for private partnership to work together with government. William, I mean, you're in the property game. I mean, how long do you think in reality it is before people are going to be fighting over prime property in downtown Johannesburg. It's becoming the place to live, which is obviously what the MEC is talking about. Sure. That's a very interesting question. If I can talk to one uh, um, comment earlier by the MEC, um, this concept of mixed-use buildings, mm -hmm. the uh, listed uh, property sector has very little appetite for residential um, investments. So in talking about mixed-use developments where you're going to partition a building into retail components and we're talking to your good old-fashioned urban development, I mean, uh, new urbanism, you have your retail component, you have your office component, and you have your ideal residential component upstairs. Um, the, the, the sad reality is that the listed property sector does not chase uh, residential assets mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, so certainly you are going to have to partition those, those developments and house those, um, th those mixed uh, different property categories in separate buildings. Um, talking to your, uh, the, the the, the long-awaited resurgence of the of the Johannesburg CBD, and government has played an enormous role in uh, in reducing those vacancies and agitating economic development. Um, certainly, the, uh, the 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 security there have been some incredible interventions there in terms of safety, um, and and the private sector has actually moved in and converted a lot of uh, private sector office stock into into residential. Um, I, I think. Uh, by all, by all means, every uh, large country, uh, large city in the world is, is famous for, uh, for, for, for these high dense, highly densified commercial nodes. And, and, and we've got that on the table. It's just all right. down to the execution. MEC, picking up uh, from one of your speeches, uh, I understand that uh, you recently undertook a trip to Asia to look at uh, uh, almost a global uh, comparison and pick up some best practices around this uh, area of urban and inner city renewal. What are the highlights for you or the key takeaway that uh, you think uh, might just work in this particular context? I think the important thing for me is that uh, South Africa, particularly a place like Gauteng, is uh, very well comp comparative to many uh, places I've seen in the world, from mm. roads to buildings to whatever. And, and the difference is, of course, is that um, uh, the rate at which we're moving, we're moving slower than uh, the rest of the, comparing the, with the rest of the emerging markets, particularly developing countries. And I think we want to accelerate and, and look at those things uh, at differently then. So that's why now we, we want to move very fast on the renewable energy to make sure that buildings um, are uh, retrofitted to, 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 to work on solar because the countries that are using solar are countries that are not exposed to the sun to the extent that we are exposed in, mm -hmm. in Africa. And also one of the things we've seen is the a usage of uh, of, na of natural gas or gas uh, for cooking and heating, which is something that is less used here. And I think the work that we've done with the team in the department suggests that if we're to reticulate gas pipeline to the extent that we want to, um, uh, supporting hospitals, that will also benefit uh, households. We've taken a number of uh, the wealthier sub suburbs in Gauteng to say if we were to get this pipeline as it's going to struggle um, in all of these suburbs and we get these households out of the grid, uh, let them uh, do use uh, gas for cooking and heating, uh, you would like to get about 300 megawatts of the grid and ESCOM is very excited by this kind of things that we're doing. Just to say, uh, also say that the, the property development in the city centre uh, you know, like in Paris, it's more expensive to live in the, in, in the inner city of Paris than to live in the periphery. One of the things mm -hmm. that really we need to try and do in South Africa is to accommodate all strata of society. Yeah. Those who can afford um, the, the expensive apartments and those who really cannot afford. Because if we want to really improve the, life, the quality of life, of the ordinary South Africans, particularly those who want to enter the, 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 the new entrance in the labor market, you've got to make living in the city a little bit um, affordable. That's why partnering with the private sector, bringing job housing company on board and the job property company on board, particularly in the inner city and all over municipalities where there's been decay in the cities. If you bring
Welcome back to the CNBC Africa debate. We're taking a closer look at Gauteng's government property assets. Still with me in studio, Kladani Mahlangu, MEC, Gauteng Department of Infrastructure Development, Eric Noir, Director of WSP Green by Design, and William Harris, CEO of G-Maven. Let's shift our focus uh, to uh, road transport. Uh, and of course, uh, the 3rd of December is a big date uh, on everybody's minds when the e-tolls <laughs> come into play. Uh, perhaps, uh, MEC, let me just get your thoughts on whether you, you think that uh, the communications behind this particular project could have been better. Before we get to uh, the, the nuts and bolts of you know, whether, uh, about whether people should be paying or not, could it have been handled better? You know, in 2000, between 2004 and 2009, the provincial government took a decision uh, to invest in the freeway improvement scheme. Uh, it's in that context that all of these things we're talking about today that were born, and we've um, went to Sandral to for them to be able to implement this project on our behalf. And and I can say with authority that uh, Gauteng roads uh, are comparable to many places in the world. You talk about New York, about Washington, about Paris, about London, and and, and name big cities. So it's in that context that I think we must really try and and work together with South Africans to understand what is it that we're trying to do. Um, of course, um, the taste is in the eating, uh, mm -hmm. is in the pudding, and I think we need to really um, work such that uh, we appreciate the infrastructure we have uh, on the basis of that, uh, you know, as I'm saying, I was saying earlier on, Prasa is investing money into improving public transport. The very same provincial government, supported by national government, we put the how train on board. And at the time, people said, this is a first world idea in a third world country, it's not going to work. How train is one of the success stories in Africa, yeah. and it was done in Gauteng. So I do want to really suggest to all South Africans, let's work together with the provincial government and supporting, uh, supported by national government to make sure that the infrastructure in the province that we've put in place and we want to continue to invest in uh, it's something that all of us must appreciate going forward. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about the how train in a minute but just as a businessman uh, not just a member of this panel I mean do you th are you happy to pay for e-tolls are you happy to carry the costs? The e-toll will impose a radically different logic mm. on this city the, the reality I mean, if we look at Santon, for instance, two major developments of 130,000 square meters of bulk on either side, requiring 4,700 parking bays each. That's a queue of 30 kilometers coming into that basement yes. in the morning, mm. and another queue going to the other basement on the other side. Now, what are we doing to ourselves? And we're right on top of the high train station. Mm. So the, the question about whether we're paying or not or what the financing mechanism, uh, I'm not too fascinated by that, but I'm far more fascinated to find a way of operating which relies a lot less on individual mobility because mm. that cannot carry on. That is the biggest mm. drain on the African economies. Mm. I mean, MEC, I mean, the how train as well, there's been talk of long-term plans to extend it to Rudaport, to Soweto, and even further than that, which I think would be popular with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But how far away are those plans? I mean, let me see if I probably is the appropriate person to talk about this, but when we conceived how train um, in those days, uh, up until we adjudicated and got a consortium to build how train, and I happen to have been one of the fortunate uh, MECs, women MECs to serve in that political committee, the idea has always been we must use how train as the first public investment into improving public sector, pub public uh, transport infrastructure on the basis of that how train must be used as a backbone um, uh, to support and, 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 and extend it across the province. Not only how train, one of the things we spoke about in those days and talking to the consortium that won the tender to say, you must make sure that there's intermodal connection. If I am on a how train, I should be able to use the same ticket in a bus, a PATCO bus, mm -hmm. I should be able to use the same mm -hmm. ticket in a text and all of that. And I know Amy Sivadi is working with all the stakeholders to work towards this thing. So the expansion and the improvement, the expansion of how train and the improvement of what Metro Rail is doing is simply all of it uh, geared towards this. You see that all the cities uh, in Gauteng, Tuane is busy building their BRT, mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, road infrastructure, and, and converting, converting uh, some of the roads in the inner city to accommodate the BRT. Egruleni is going to start that process. So all of this is about efforts of making sure that Gauteng is very small. Within five hours, I can go north, south, east, west, literally. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. as compared to other provinces. So therefore, the mobility of people does not know the boundaries in the province. Mm -hmm. So that is what we are working towards. And, and again, the point you're raising in the beginning, what is the role of infrastructure? That's why provincial government and municipalities, and if the private sector come on board, we partner together. I think this province will continue to be not only contributing 36% of the GDP, probably will move to about the 50% of the GDP. And that's what we must all work towards. Let me see, uh, you know, when one uh, hears these uh, plans that Chris has raised, uh, they, there's almost a bit of caution in terms of the response because of prior experiences of going over budget uh, and the implications that uh, consumers then have to take on. What are the key lessons that we perhaps have already learned that uh, as we begin to expand our infrastructure network that we, we could build in to ensure that we contain the cost to the numbers that are initially projected? Okay, let me just give an example of one of the hospitals that was started in 2008, 6, 7, a Jabulani hospital, a district hospital in Soweet, which is a hospital that's going to alleviate pressure from Krishna Paraguana. It's a 300 bed hospital. A first problem happens when we appointed a contractor who comes and say lied about their CIDP level status and they don't have a tax clearance. So firstly, whatever cost projection we had and then we go to court litigation after litigation. By the time we conclude those processes, probably a year or 18 months has lapsed and the costs have already changed. That's the first problem that leads into those mm -hmm. kind of things. You get into the next phase, you get the next contractor. Of course, they've got to, to cost the eggs to where the, where the other company left off and how do they take the process forward. And the third problem is that when, as, as government, we not... Um, the cash flow to the, to the project is not guaranteed. There were a lot of stop and start with that hospital. So if we're to deal with the planning prior, mm -hmm. And, and ensuring that the contracting is uh, uh, astute and, and really um, up to scratch and, and the cash flows are guaranteed to the contractor within the time frame of the, of the contract. We're not going to have those overrun. And I'm just using this hospital to talk to the issue. And how train is a different matter altogether. I do not know um, in terms of that. The, the, of course, in the initial stages, um, remember this project was born in the first cabinet of the province between 1994 and 1999. Between then and the time we finally adjudicated, which was uh, 2005 in, Ju in July, mm. Uh, when we finally adjudicated and that a lot of time has passed, plus close to about uh, seven or eight years or so. And of course, the cost can't be the same. You know it very well uh, from either the cement or this and this and that. And of course, you're bringing international companies on board and uh, that doesn't come at the rent that is um, uh, at the fixed price and all of those things. So we've got to look into that. So I think we must really be fair. Uh, and look at that project by project based on what has happened, where there are lessons, of course. We've taken lessons from the project like the Zola Hospital, as well as Natal Spray. The Natal Spray Hospital, um, there's not been any cost overruns per se, but it's simply the fact that, again, the contractor was a capable contractor. We simply were not in the pool. We were doing a lot of deviation in the process. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a theater today. No, we need five. We only need five. We need 10. Oh, we don't need 10. We need this and this and that. So if we're to just have a clear, like the schools we do, we're building now. <coughs> We've got a prototype of all the, of all high schools, mm -hmm. a prototype of all uh, uh, primary schools, and on the basis of that, there is no project that we've delivered in the past 10, 12 months that has had cost overruns. Instead, companies have gone beyond what we scope uh, the scope that was given to them, and they've delivered world class infrastructure in the township. You must go and see them. The schools have combi courts, uh, tennis, uh, basketball, um, uh, netball. They've got the uh, rugby fields, uh, uh, cricket, and all of those, including track and field. So you're likely to have uh, get a young person who's emerging there with um, a fully fledged um, uh, competencies, all of those, including having libraries as well as laboratories in those schools. All of them are part of the cost. But all of these plans, <laughs> MEC, as laudable as they are, um, there is nothing without electricity. And one of the infrastructure challenges you face is that City Power in particular does have rundown infrastructure, um, some of it dating back to the 60s and 70s, which needs to be replaced. What are you trying to do about that? As I was making the point early that, uh, I mean, on Monday, uh, we had a dinner hosted by ESCOM. So I went there on behalf of the provincial government and all municipalities were there. And I think on Friday last week, we had a meeting, uh, which is a premier's coordinating forum, where all municipalities <laughs> were presenting um, their state of investment in infrastructure. I can say with authority, for instance, in Tuana, you've got some of the power stations which are not working. 
um, they're currently um, in a process of getting some some those come those, those electricity those power stations uh, to either uh, get new investment or simply to do something about them um, and I know city power is putting a lot of money in investment similarly with ESCOM they are putting a lot of money in transmission and distribution of course municipalities are also upgrading um, the reticulation into the household. One thing for sure that is really uh, not helpful in our country is when people do not want to pay for services. Mm. Um, and I know that Swane is implementing a pay-as-you-go. Um, I know we know with cell phones, if I don't have a time, I can't make a call. Right. Mm. So why can't we all, and Twane is implementing across the board, whether you are a wealthier suburb in Waterkloof or you are a, a living in Amanskral in a township, you're going to get a prepaid meter. So if all of us were really to, uh, to appreciate that a prepaid meter helps me as a consumer to consume based on my pocket, we'll be in a position to, to deal with them, uh, the security of energy uh, in, in a lot. I think the point that was made earlier about government rules that have been introduced to to encourage citizens to retrofit. Yes, it may be costly to retrofit today, but over a long period of time, if you look at how much money you pay on electricity on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. uh, that money, it will be compensated over a period of time. There are cases of people who've retrofitted their homes and we, we can afford, the middle class can really afford, of course, not on one tranche, not on two days, but we can uh, spread your budget over a period of time, invest in, in getting uh, your house to be fully retrofitted and over time you will pay lesser in electricity cost and you'll benefit from that. I think one of the things that we're working with national government on is to improve is to get um, not I don't think it's incentivizing but is to allow people the mid people to to retrofit their homes so that if you've got additional energy that you you have in your house how do we get it into the grid and if we can just really cross that and get agreement on the grid conversion it will really allow many people to 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 be self-sufficient whatever energy you don't need including this government building water retrofitting whatever excess energy it can simply be um, be bought by ESCOM by whoever including the IPPs and then all of that and I think that is going to help people better to come to the party faster. So Eric Noir, I mean this is your business, do you think people are, are, are getting into the idea now that um, this is the way to save money as well as the environment? Yeah absolutely I think you know it's quite interesting to take the the car analogy mm. uh, where 10 years ago somebody would buy a big four-wheel drive diesel V8, I'll take the V8 because I go to the park and it scares the animal, you know, the noise <laughs> of the diesel and I think, but the one costs twice as much as the other to run. Yeah. People are now very acute at assessing and, and again it's a, it's a government uh, legislation that mandates car manufacturers to disclose your carbon emissions and your fuel consumption. Um, so people are making choices based on that. Uh, the same start to occur with buildings. People are starting to ask nice building, nice house, nice office, I like it, but what is it going to cost me mm. to run on a monthly basis? If you're paying, say, 150 rand a square meter in rental and you, you running cost runs into the 50, 60 rand a month per square meter, it's a substantial portion. You can no longer negotiate your lease just on the deal you get mm. per square meter per month. I mean, you, you would know that. Uh, people are asking the right questions more and more, uh, and and it's certainly becoming far more uh, into the forefront of the debate. Would you then say, uh, Eric, that its uh, cost is becoming more important than compliance in this particular space? Whatever drives people is not terribly important at mm -hmm. the end of the day. People are doing the right things. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some government policies and legislation which forces people into a corner to make the right decision because there's a compliance or there's a financial incentive or there's a tax or, or whatever the case might be. But people are making the right choices more and more and I think that we're leading towards a much more sustainable society as a result. Just a quick comment from you, William. I mean, how, how do you see it in the, from the property angle? Yeah, I, I see it, I'm picking up on Azipo's point. I think it's mm -hmm. being driven by economic fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, the screenification is a very compelling case for it. Uh, Property developers are getting better returns on their on their hard run equity to put it into unification, and uh, the, the tenants at the end of the day are benefiting also. So, MEC, one question we must raise in this debate is the question of water. Um, it's a big infrastructure headache. There's a lot of scary stories out there saying that the quality it may be threatened in the future. There are leaks which cost uh, the water. Um, utility dearly every year. What are you trying to do about that to, to sort it out? 
You know, we've got some work that we're doing with the um, uh, Department of Water Affairs nationally uh, that will sim that uh, looks at detecting leaks in the schools, mm -hmm. uh, in the hospitals, uh, and all over in government public buildings. Because if we arrest this, the leaks, um, it's going to help all of us. Secondly, I think if uh, citizens uh, must all we must all come to the party. If citizens see a leak, um, I mean, when I cycle, there's a on Friedland Drive. Uh, passing through Din, they, there was a leak for quite a while. And the other day I said to the MMC, you know, there's a problem there and there. And she always sends people whatever. If we were to all come and become active citizens when I see a leak and a report, because mm -hmm. there is a report that was published a while ago, I can't remember who was the publisher, who says, um, I think Gauteng municipalities lose about uh, 30 to between 30 and 40 percent of water losses um, in the in the province, and we can do a lot about it because. And if you look at uh, there's a region Emilia, a city in in Italy, their water loss is below five percent. Um, the Singapore, their water loss again is below five percent, and they are wanting to reduce it even further. They've got detectors all over the show, so we want to start with the public buildings because uh, I mean, if you, in hospitals they, they they can't do without water, um, the schools they can't do without water. If we just to arrest the problem at the in those public buildings, mm -hmm. and all of us come to the party in municipalities, I know that there's work that we're doing. There's a particular target that has been set uh, per municipality, job of water, and then all municipalities of for reducing that water loss, it's going to go a long way. However, there's an education that we must all come to the party to. Um, I've often made this example, it's as stupid as it is. When we brush our teeth, we all open the tap and we leave it on whilst you're brushing your teeth. We should start by those small things and say, when I brush my teeth, you wet your toothbrush and then you switch off them, you, you close the tap, and then you can switch, uh, put it on once you finish uh, brushing your teeth and, and wash your mouth. But uh, it's just start with those little things. Mm. Uh, in the shower, up, up we, they gave, someone gave me a, um, a little gadget that is a five minutes timer. And people say it's impossible to shower within five minutes. And if you really want to conserve water, we must start with those uh, things and say, if I'm in a shower, I can't be in the shower for more than five minutes. Yes, you can afford to pay the water. There's no one is going to argue with you that. But if you want the water to be lasting, not for your generation, mm -hmm. but for future generation, we need to start change our behavior. And there's many, many things. Uh, for instance, some of the things we're doing in the schools about the water thing, we are there's a school in social movie, for instance. The school can go on without any supply of water from the municipality. They, uh, all the schools we're building, they do rainwater harvesting, they um, collecting that water and they clean the water from the, um, the whatever from the sewer and they recycle it then back into the thing. And the gardens and the water, the, the, the grass in the, in, in the uh, track and field, sports field are watered by, by, by through that water. So there's a lot of things we can do. And I know people who live in posh houses have difficulties <laughs> to have a Jojo tank hanging in your, in your roof. But we must do those things if we want indeed to have this water sustainable for future generations. Well, let me generation. say, assure at this stage, I do switch the tap off, so I just want to make it clear there, but uh, I see you about to jump in there. Yeah, no, it's quite interesting when it gets to energy, for instance, we're in 2008, beginning 2008, end of 2007, when, when we started to have the rolling blackouts. Yes. The debate moved from energy efficiency, should we, shouldn't we, to yeah. energy security. Yeah. I need to have yes. backup. We haven't crossed that line with water, water yet. We're still into water efficiency. We need to save, should we invest in rainwater, shouldn't we? Uh, at some point, and now we start to talk about water resiliency, we start to see entire office block, entire development buildings putting tank. Yes. If suddenly you have a water cut for a reason or another, not necessarily a shortage of water, but just maintenance on a pipeline mm. or something, if your office doesn't operate with water, people are just going home. You can't use the ablution, you can't, you know, you're mm. losing so much in, in productivity that people start to embark on that. And I think we haven't crossed that line yet in, in terms of water, but it's, it's really short term Perha coming. Perhaps the way to cross that line uh, is on the back of innovation and technology. And I, I particularly want to pick up on one of the pilot projects where uh, you're running an e-maintenance uh, program. And I understand this is at Chris Honeyberg Barak with Hospital as well. Perhaps let me see, you know, I know this is in pilot phase, but what are the trends that are, are coming out? Do you think that uh, such an electronic platform can be used um, with other uh, public projects? You know, actually, that's a very interesting project. I, I just love it because it was developed internally, no consultant, by DID employees 
who are found in the system, they develop it. Of course, Pricewaterhouse will ask him, where did you do this thing? Can you buy it and whatever? That's how good it is. Um, it internally developed, and, and it's not only in Chris Paraguay that now it's being rolled out to all uh, hospitals. The intention really is to allow the artisans. We've got more than, in Para alone, we've got more than 60 people that are working there, from plumbers to mechanicals to uh, whatever, uh, of different the artisans, of, to boiler makers, the artisans of different kind. So the plan really is to uh, identify a problem for any citizen who can walk into the hospital and um, when they go to the toilet, the toilet is not flashing, they can log in by SMS or Twitter or whatever and the, 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 the problem gets logged into, into the system and of course it will be allocated to a particular person and there's a clear supervision uh, whether it's done within um, 24 hours or within whatever. If it's not done, it's also indicate that it was reported so and so was supposed to do it, they did not do it. You're also holding people accountable but over and above that, uh, then the employee says, okay, now that we've got this system, we're able to pick up problem and it has improved our productivity, but we don't have tools. You know that a few days ago, we gave all the, our artisans, I think up to today, they all of them 500 and odd artisans who've never had toolboxes and have those toolboxes uh, from all the different types of artisans. Now they can walk into the place when the water is leaking uh, from the tap and fix it instantly. Instead of going and we issue a tender and we're intending to really uh, complete that process by having the stores to have all the nuts and bolts and whatever they need for them to be able to fix the problem instead of going to tender. And I'm really excited about it because you simply through the capacity of the state, uh, was using state employees for them to be productive and resolve problems. So it is working and so far the CEO of Krishani Paraguay uh, whom I've seen I'm still going to visit all the hospital he's on top of the world. William let's bring you in on that technology and innovation point I mean understanding that G Maven is also perhaps one of those companies that really has uh, uh, its finger on the pulse of using technology to address uh, some of its business challenges can we see an extrapolation of that into some of the developmental challenges that we, we, we face as a province off the back of technology? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, that whole white collar revolution concept, um, it, it is real, it is happening. Technology is capable of doing work that people have historically done far cheaper, far more efficiently, um, with far higher reduced, reduced error rates. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely see technology playing a very active role in solving a lot of these types of problems as the initiative, um, as the MEC discussed earlier. And I just think one last point on water, which we can't escape, is acid mine drainage. I mean, a lot of people have been talking about it. It's a money. It's, I know that the council has been trying to throw money at it, the provincial government. But uh, what? How much of a threat is it still? You think? I mean, if you read the papers, we'd be up to our knees by now. Um, but <laughs> just tell us what exactly uh, you're going to do uh. about it. I, I know that there's a lot of work that has been done by provincial government and national government working with different private companies, um, particularly water affairs. Um, in, there isn't even an interministerial uh, committee in this. Uh, my understanding is that this water can be treated and be reusable um, for probably for, for, for other purposes, not for drinking purposes. And, and that work is continuing as to how far are we, but I think there were different basins, the Western Basin and this and that, um, the w which were identified particularly around the mining areas, which is the Western, as well as the Gruleni. So there is work being done that the water can be treated and be reused again, uh, but not for drinking purposes. But uh, uh, we are doing work on that. So on that uh, note and, and those robust uh, conversations sessions. Let's turn our focus now to the audience. Ladies and gentlemen, we now open the floor to you to pose uh, your questions uh, to the panel that we have at the desk. Um, hello. Um, I and perhaps uh, I see there's a lady right I at the a back. A please yes, please I, please I have a question. MEC, in terms of waste management, are you <coughs> satisfied that the correct systems are in place to keep the province clean? Do we have another question uh, that m perhaps we can bundle them into groups of three? There's a question for, with the gentleman right in the front, please. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, I think the province is doing a lot of work in terms of maintaining the infrastructure. And um, more recently, there's been you know, a drive to get the um, Houting Planning Commission up and running or the Houting uh, Cities Observatory uh, going. Could you please tell us um, what you know work has been done thus far, and um, you know what's the plan in terms of uh, rolling out the vision 2055? 
So maybe we can take those uh, to MEC? Uh, firstly, you know, this morning I had a breakfast with uh, friends of mine from the private sector. One of the things we're discussing is how do we get the city center very clean um, by bringing the big corporates that are operating in the city center. You talk about, I mean, Anglo-American, they've got a half offices in town, BH Billiton, APSA, a computer share, and, and all of them are not far from where DID is located, where the premier's office, uh, where the precinct of the provincial government is. Uh, one of the things we're really trying to do is to, uh, just if you take the inner city alone, is to partner with the big corporates that are operating in the city center uh, to make sure that we, we get people uh, in the street to help cleaning the, 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 the city center, and, and of course, in turn, uh, link them to some uh, life skill training which can get them off the streets and all of that and that, that's one of the things that we're discussing but we are partnering with um, a number of people and I know MEC Vadi has a vision and they're talking to the city of Johannesburg in getting uh, more streets uh, to be car free and um, like I think Main Street is currently uh, between um, Simon Street and all the way up to Gandhi Street to get them also to be like so that you can have a lot of coffee shops and people to be walking around and we have uh, very few cars all the way up to down Main Street where the, um, the hundred on the main um, uh, restaurants is um, and that's those are the plan we've also have um, we've unleashed about uh, uh, five six thousand young um, uh, women and, and young people uh, through uh, EP extended public works programs, a program we call Zivuseni Reloaded, which a premier launched uh, two weeks ago. And that program is simply meant at uh, making sure that we keep uh, government properties, whether it be it um, schools, clinics, uh, uh, courts, and all of those things, just a general upkeep and uh, just a, a good look and feel when you are um, uh, moving around those areas. So that's the work that we're doing. And I know the Department of uh, GDARTE, which is our agriculture, rural, uh, rural and agricultural development department, is driving the the, 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 the environmental thing, the city of Joburg is giving people um, a three different bins for you to, for purpose of side recycling, plastic, food, and, and bottles. So that there is a lot of work that is being done, and probably they can be discussing with the relevant MEC on that. Um, in terms of the, the G2055, um, there's a number of things we're doing, and I think EXCO uh, is going to be is, is busy discussing the work that has been done by the Planning Commission, including all the uh, the different um, uh, researches that has been uh, whatever commissioned uh, by the Planning Commission. Uh, over and above that, there is work. Uh, the, the, in the 25-year plan of the Integrated Transport Plan is part of this. Uh, one of the milestones in this, we're also doing together the DID with the Planning Commission. We're doing the how they integrated master plan, um, uh, infrastructure master plan, which simply says will let us know, will be able to help us to have a prototype of how they and be able to guide developers appropriately, but over and above that, it will also help us what are the uh, in line with the special development plans, where are the growth, uh, growth uh, patterns in the province, uh, what kind of infrastructure we need and all of that. And if you look at uh, uh, countries like Singapore, China, and, and many others, uh, including in Europe, you have a, a, a kind of like a prototype where you can walk in and say, okay, um, in this space there is a building a space for, for office place in this place is a, a place for a park, for a golf course and all of those. Therefore, as an investor, you know upfront that that place has been rezoned for that. So the integrated master plan and the prototype that will finally be, be located in the planning house is going to help us to do those. So, so those are some of the uh, important aspects that are supporting uh, the, uh, the G2055 vision. But we are really hoping that uh, when we celebrate the the 100 years of the Freedom Charter, how thing indeed will be a different place from what we live in now. They were busy finalizing the norms and standards guided by what we're saying in the G2055, access to schooling, access uh, to, um, uh, to, 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 to health facilities. Currently, we're saying after like within every five kilometer radius in Gauteng, there's a clinic or there's a health facility as compared to, to other parts of the province. So we may say into the future, based on the future growth of the population, do we want to um, decrease that or whatever? So those are some of the things that um, will be finalized uh, in, uh, uh, in the next uh, few, few months or so. Thank we'll you. We'll take a final question uh, from <coughs> the audience. Uh, is there a question? Yes, so this is gentleman over there. Hi. Um, how important is security in managing Gauteng's property assets and what measures are in place? Security, security in managing property assets and what measures are in place? <laughs> um, 
the point I was making early on that we don't know, we still don't know what we own, where, and, and whatever, uh, makes it difficult to pro have a proper security plan. Uh, because uh, if I don't know that I own a building, uh, if it's hijacked, so I wouldn't know that it's hijacked right. unless someone comes to me, whatever. So where we know that it's our building and we need to be secured, we've uh, instituted um, security measures, for instance, the Valdem, uh, there's huge uh, vast tracts of land that the provincial government own in there. We've uh, put in a security company. Um, there's a extra Zivuseni um, a team that is going to be working there, cutting the grass and doing also kind of thing. Whilst we are going to the market to look for investors to come to the party and help us to develop the place. Uh, similarly, we draw the plot. You know that we're fighting with the oh, not fighting with people are fighting us. The rowing association. So we're trying to clean up um, and ensure that properties that are owned by the state not only a hijack but people do as they please you can't develop in a place that does not belong to you without permission uh, to correct those kind of things so um, it is difficult now to have a proper full security plan but would, over time as I said with the timelines that we've set ourselves uh, with an Ernest and Young um, a, a consortium will be in a position um, to, to be able to provide that security over a period of time once we know what we own but what we know own now and we know that means security we do provide but is ad hoc. Right. Thank mm -hmm. you, MEC. Perhaps let's get some uh, closing and final remarks and maybe we'll start with you, Eric. I think we need, we're living in incredibly exciting times in an exciting place. Uh, Houteng in particular, but I think South Africa and, and Africa by and large, uh, uh, we will be, I think, leading the rest of the world in the field of sustainability within 10 to 15 years from now in having find appropriate solutions to carefully balance uh, the sustainability equation. And William Harris from the property <laughs> end of things. <laughs> yes, I'm going to be biased. Um, property is an incredibly uh, information imperfect, big IP barriers to entry asset class. I applaud uh, the MEC for bringing it in underneath one roof where there are certain where skills can be applied and developed to, uh, to manage the, that asset class effectively. Um, and, uh, and I wish the MEC good luck. It's, uh well, that's a wrap of this special debate on Gauteng's government property assets. Thanks again to my guest, Badani Mashlangu, MEC, Gauteng Department of Infrastructure Development, Eric Noir, Director of WSP Green by Design, and William Harris, CEO of G Maven, and of course, my co-host, Chris Bishop. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>